a pair of cruel and pitiless killers who googled can wives be imprisoned together. They would jail for life for abusing two-year-old Liam Fee to death and trying to blame the murder on another boy. Today I have two stories of mothers who took the lives of children. We start with Liam Fee. Toddler Liam suffered more than 30 external injuries when he was to death by his mother Rachel Fee and her partner Naomi Fee at their home near Glen Rhodes, Fife in East Scotland. The couple who were convicted of the shocking murder following a seven-week trial was sentenced to life in prison at the High Court in Edinburgh by a judge who condemned their cruel and pitiless regime of ill-treatment and neglect. Receiving mandatory life sentences, Naomi Fee was ordered to spend a minimum of 24 years in prison, while Liam's mother, Rachel, was told she must serve 23 and a half years. They are currently being held in different prisons, one at HMP Cornton Vale in Stirling and another at Edinburgh Jail, and it is expected they will remain apart as co-accused defendants are not normally housed in the same prison. The pair displayed little emotion as their sentences were delivered, one after the other, and there was silence in the packed courtroom as the pair were led away to the cells. Liam's father, Joseph Johnson, looked straight ahead as the women were told the punishment parts of their life sentences. The court had heard how defenceless Liam died at his home in March 2014, having suffered car crash style injuries, including a ruptured heart as a result of severe blunt force trauma to his body. And in all the true crime cases I have covered, I don't think I've ever heard the term ruptured heart. What the hell did they do to this boy? The trial heard how the couple originally from Tyne and Weir carried out two years of sustained attacks and on the toddler and two other boys as social services repeatedly failed to act. The pair's depraved abuse included imprisoning one boy in a cage made from a fire guard, using cable ties to bind his hands behind his back. They also tied another boy naked to a chair in a dark room and you gotta ask yourself what is the point? Why would you even do that? What the hell is wrong with this couple? In the cage were nine snakes and several rats, forcing the toddler to eat his own vomit and telling him a boa constrictor, naughty little boys. They also forced the youngsters to take cold showers when they wet the bed. Lord Burns told the killers, each of you had responsibility for the care and welfare of the three young children with whom this case was concerned. You both grossly abused those responsibilities and subjected them to a cruel and pitiless regime of ill treatment and neglect while in your joint care. He added that it appeared from the video interviews with the boys that they were obviously and profoundly damaged by the women's treatment of them which is a good point. I can only imagine the surviving boys, the trauma they will now have as they grow older. Now, initially the couple had denied taking Liam's life and instead tried to blame his death on one of the two other young boys. Their names cannot be named for legal reasons. However, a jury of eight women and six men found them guilty by majority. They were accused of assault and murder after a seven week trial. Prosecutor Alex Prentice told the court that the women were guilty of unyielding heartless cruelty. In harrowing evidence, the jury heard Liam had suffered heart injuries similar to those found on road crash victims, with more than 30 external injuries on his body including injuries to his chest and abdomen. The court heard the pair knew Liam had a broken leg and fractured arm, but instead of seeking help, they searched the internet for terms including how do you die of a broken hip and can wives be imprisoned together. You know what's worse about that? Recently, last week, my son who's three, he actually fractured his arm. He was walking down the stairs, right? He slipped and then his arm hit the wall or something, right? But he seemed okay, he was holding his arm, but you could see the look on his face. He did not like what he was feeling. It was new to him, right? He's only three, he's never really experienced that kind of pain. Seeing a boy, Seeing his face with a fracture, it broke me. 
Now imagine hip issues, 30 bones broken or whatever it may be. These women didn't give a fuck. Jurors heard there had been an escalation of violence towards the blonde haired blue eyed boy leading up to his death. Their callous indifference to his injuries would have left the child in agony. But the killers refused to get him medical aid, choosing instead to search the internet on their phones under terms such as how can you live with a broken bone. Under oath, the women admitted serious failings over the lack of medical help sought for Liam and put it down to fears the child would be taken into care. But they denied murder and as part of their web of lies, tried to shift the blame for the killing onto a boy of only primary school age who they claimed had been acting in a sexualized way towards Liam. The boy was so scared of the women, he initially told police and social workers that he had strangled the toddler, but suffocation was not the cause of death. The evidence pointed to a significant delay between the discovery of the women that Liam was dead and the emergency services being contacted by a seemingly hysterical fee shortly before 8pm on the night in question. The panicking pair used the time instead to dismantle a makeshift cage they had built to imprison the youngster they falsely accused of killing Liam. The couple, who had no previous convictions, were convicted of assaulting Liam over more than two years prior to his death and of ill-treating and neglecting him from January 2012 onwards. But I don't get it. Why would you do that? Why just like torture him for no reason? How young does a boy have to be for him to actually piss you off so much for you to act in that manner? They denied the youngsters access to the toilet and then forced them to take cold showers when they wet the bed. Imprisoning one in a homemade cage and tying another naked to a chair in a dark room where snakes and rats were kept after telling him that a boa constrictor ate naughty boys. Now, the lawyer who represented Rachel Fee told the court that she fully accepts responsibility in relation to the failure to obtain medical treatment for Liam's broken leg. However, to the remainder of the charges, such as homicide, murder or whatever, and the guilty verdict, she maintained her position that effectively so far as she, she was concerned, there has been a miscarriage of justice and that she did not commit these offences. Miscarriage of justice? Forget the murder. You put a boy in a cage, you put snakes and rats around him. Fucking explain that, dumbass. The lawyer said that his client had effectively been disowned by her entire family. She is going to spend the rest of her life in prison and there really is no one there to visit her. The lawyer went on to say, Rachel Fee has to live with the fact that her two-year-old son is dead. She has been convicted of his murder and she will never see him again. Well, duh, that's what happens when you murder your own child. Another lawyer said, in the course of her evidence, she accepted responsibility for the neglect of Liam Fee in relation to failing to obtain medical assistance. She accepted in her evidence that there was an unforgivable breach in her responsibility towards the child. My client maintains her plea of innocence in relation to the remainder of the indictment where she acknowledges and respects the verdict of the jury with which she disagrees. Well, your respect or your disagreement does nothing for the young boy now, does it? After a significant case review was carried out into the circumstances of Liam's death. After a number of witnesses told the trial they had raised concerns about the toddler's health and well-being. Following the sentencing, Detective Inspector Rory Hamilton, who led the investigation, he said, the thoughts of all those connected to our investigation remain with Liam's wider family and those who knew him during his short life. The killers who were in custody in the same prison during their trial their cells were on different floors inside the Ross House building, where remand inmates were kept. But the pair who regularly held hands on their way in and out of their trial were said to have been able to meet over a coffee. A prison source said they will have met. They are on different floors, but there will be times during the day when the cells are open and they'll be able to associate. They're not sharing a cell. Prisoners can go out of their cells to eat in the hall. It would have been a risk assessment. This was before it went to trial. In the trial itself, the Crown began with hearing from the youngster the couple wrongly blamed for Liam's death. He was questioned by a female officer and a male social worker on various occasions in the weeks after the toddler died. The interview started when the small boy dressed in jeans and a t-shirt walked in and sat on a sofa, tucking his legs up beside him. The jury heard the boy tell how he was not allowed to get up to go to the toilet during the night, which sometimes meant he wet the bed. He told interviewers that he would have to go get a cold shower as punishment 
which would leave him shaking. The boy said he would then have to stand on a towel in the corridor of the house and would have to drip dry there, sometimes without even a vest on. He later told how he had been tied to a locked home cage during the night. The boy told police his hands and feet would be bound with cable ties to the makeshift cage out of fire guard and bars. The child also described how he would sometimes be naked in the cage and his hands tied behind his back. At other times, he would be tied to a cot with a dressing gown cord and coat belts. The same boy also said he fell unconscious when Fee put her foot on his neck as he lay on the floor. She also hurt the child during the attack. The trial further heard how the boy tried to flee on three separate occasions from the Fee's house and even made a rope out of bandages to aid his escape. He said, I tried to run away because of the bad treatment. The second boy also gave an interview. He said he was banned from going to the toilet in the night but given cold showers for 15 to 20 minutes before he went to bed. One day he spent the whole day in a cold shower, drip drying in between. In the video interviews, the boy said Fee tied him naked to a chair and left him alone in a room all night in the dark with snakes and rats in boxes. The boy also said he was scared of the dark. He said he felt unsafe with both women and was scared of being punished when he stayed with them. The courage of the two young boys was crucial in allowing police to unravel the web of lies spun by the two women. Both of the primary school aid children were present in the house on the night Liam died and within minutes of police arriving the women had pointed the finger of blame to them. And at that point he told them that he strangled the toddler by putting his hands over his mouth. But the police learned not long after that this was a lie because the death was not by strangulation. The truth was teased out over the course of the following weeks. The carefully planned interviews were carried out by a public protection officer trained in questioning children and a social worker who slowly won the trust of the weary and withdrawn boys. Police officer Hamilton said, During those video recorded interviews, it became quite clear that both the children, along with Liam, would appear to have been subjected to a catalogue of significant abuse over a long period of time. Now, what was significant for police was that each story of each child was corroborating each other's events. And when you look into account the fact that they'd been separated immediately upon the police arrival, that was very good evidence. Hamilton added, It is not plausible for two young boys to get together, make up a story of such elaborate nature, and then be expected to stick to that. So I'm absolutely no doubt if what has happened and the importance that the courage shown by the young boys. Without the evidence of the boys, it clearly would have been very, very difficult to have got this case to court. And I go back to what I said in the beginning. Why on earth would these two monsters do this? Send them to the dogs. Send them to prison. Never let them see the light of day ever again. Minimum term of 24 years, I say 124 years. Now we move on to the story of two-year-old Satina Corley in Ireland. Michael Corley, her father, trusted Karen Harrington and did not have any concerns about leaving his daughter with her. Santina was found by Mr. Corley, critically injured under a soiled duvet on the morning of July the 5th, 2019, in Karen's apartment. Santina was naked and clumps of the little girl's hair were found in the woman's apartment. The injuries were so devastating that there was no chance of survival for the toddler. Satina had sustained 53 catastrophic injuries, including fractures to her skull, two fractured ribs, fractures to her right arm and left leg and bruising to her entire body. The first officer who arrived at the scene, David Tobin, told how Santina was lying on a kilt and looked like a child's doll. He said, the best way I can describe it is her legs were twisted like a child doll. Her eyes were only slightly open. Her hands were lying by her side. Her head was back and she was naked and she had a bruise on her forehead and she was not breathing. I think there was a small bit of blood in her mouth. Neighbours had reported hearing an almighty commotion coming from the apartment during the night. One neighbour gave evidence that he heard Karen taunting the child and telling her to shut up. The jury was told that she was mocking, taunting and terrorising little Santina. Neighbours also reported that they listened to shouting and roaring from the apartment with Karen slamming a sliding door 30 to 40 times shouting, everyone wake the fuck up. Now the state pathologist, Dr. Margaret Bolster, 
told the court that the skull fracture would have stopped her ability to cry. She would have lapsed into a coma. The doctor gave evidence that Santina died as a result of a traumatic brain injury, an upper spinal cord injury coupled with polytrauma and lower limb injuries due to blunt force trauma. She said the blunt force trauma arose when Santina was something or struck against something. She stressed the injuries were not consistent with an accidental fall, pointing to the multiplicity of injuries and the fact that they were all over her body. Santina had bruising to her forehead, side of the face, lower jaw in addition to her right arm, lower left arm, hands and feet. Wow, this kid was abused everywhere. While she also found a tear to the piltrum, the flesh between the upper lip and gum. The assistant state pathologist said that Santina had bleeding of one centimeter deep under her scalp, while they were also bleeding into the spinal cord for the full length of her spinal cord. Karen gave evidence in the witness box where she vehemently denied any involvement in the murder. Under cross-examination, she told the prosecutor she was not responsible, and the prosecutor asked her to solve the mystery of what had occurred. Karen said she had thought about that for a number of days and had no answer. The prosecutor said, Santina did not cause the injuries to herself. Do you accept that the only person with her was you? Karen said no. She said she had been woken from her sleep in her apartment at 3am and a row had escalated with her then partner, Mr. Corley. He left shortly after leaving Santina in the apartment. Karen also agreed that she and Santina were alone for a period of time. The prosecutor pour it to Karen that when Mr. Corley left, Santina was alive and uninjured. Karen confirmed this information. She denied taunting the child and claimed that she was crying through the night herself. Karen told the court, I did not inflict any injuries on her. The night in more detail, you see Karen and Corley had separated in 2018 and on the night of the murder, Corley returned to Karen's apartment to collect his daughter at 5 a.m. So they have an argument at 3 a.m. He leaves, he comes back at 5 a.m. That's when he found Santina lying under a blanket on the floor. And when he lifted the blanket, he saw it was spattered with blood and Santina was naked and unresponsive with injuries on her face and body. He handed Santina to Karen, who promptly handed the child back to him before leaving the apartment. Karen ran out of the apartment crying, my baby's dead, my baby's dead. Forensic officers recovered several items of evidence, including tufts, of Santina's hair, her pink top and leggings, an earring and a pair of pajama leggings with several blood stains belonging to Karen. The neighbors recollected they heard a child crying, just a child crying coming from next door. During the trial, Karen repeatedly broke down, particularly when she was shown and asked to comment on photos from the crime scene. In between tears, Karen began her account of what she said happened that night. She said she fell asleep after an argument. Santina was crying. Michael left and then returned and that's when Karen woke up. Over the course of the 14-day trial, some expressed surprise Karen had not opted for some mental health defense of diminished responsibility to try and help her conviction. In the end, the jury of seven men and four women took four hours and 46 minutes to find her guilty of the murder of Santina Corley. The closest to an explanation came from when Karen herself she was asked by the prosecution about what the evidence was saying. She said, all the evidence says to me that I was the one that did it. Karen was sentenced to life. And in both cases, the only conclusion you can come to, fucking morons, right? The first two, idiots. No reason for it. They actually were aroused by the torture of their child. They were aroused by the way that they um, treated the children. In terms of Karen, it seems she was pissed off at her ex and then she took it out on the child. Between the two, I mean, there's no monopoly on pain, but between the two, the second one has an explanation. It's awful. It's egregious, right? She should never be released, but you can follow the events. This happened, this happened. Okay. It's wrong. You're an idiot, but okay. But with the first two, with Liam, they did it because. They liked it? What? There's people out there like that? What other explanation is there? Anyway, comment, tell me what you think. The silence in courtroom number six was broken when the jury announced that Karen Harrington, seen here earlier this morning on her way into court, was guilty of murdering Santina Cawley. She showed no emotion as the verdict was returned. 
Shortly after 5am, Michael Cawley returned to find his daughter lying in a blood-stained duvet, fighting for her life. She died in her mother's arms a number of hours later. A post-mortem found two-year-old Santina Cawley, described in court as little and defenceless, sustained a complex fractured skull, an injury to her spinal cord, as well as 49 external injuries and four internal injuries. At all times, 38-year-old Harrington had denied she murdered Santina Cawley.